Good morning. How are you? Well, over the next 16 days, all the eyes are on Rio de Janeiro. They're in Brazil with the Olympics. As you can see, I've got my gold medal already. <laughs> and to, to, uh, to do well, of course, you have to be fast. You have to be strong. But most important, you need endurance. And there's, we see there's a lot of parallels to that in Scripture, that we're also in a race. We're, you know, as we're kind of paralleling this series that we're looking at, playing the game during the Olympics, but it's talking about the game that uh, obviously is more than a game, but the game that we play called, you know, following Christ. And it's, it takes endurance. And the good news is that God is committed to us to uh, getting a medal, for us to succeed and to do well. Notice the very first verse, it says, God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finished. So circle the word will. He's, he doesn't say he hopes it's all going to work out for you. It might work out for you. No, he says he's committed. It's going to happen. It's going to do well. You're going to do well. And what happens is when we put our faith in Christ, we, we, uh, we join a team that's a winning team. Samuel last week talked about being on a winning team. And that's that God's committed to us winning on his team. And so he wants us to do well. He wants us to pass the finish line. Of course, ultimately the finish line is when we go to heaven, right? But, uh, but getting to heaven is not just enough. He wants us to do well as we get there. Not everybody uh, finishes well in the Christian life, but we can. It's something that God wants, us, wants for us, that we can finish well, that we can live the life that God wants us to live, that we can discover the purpose God has for us, and we can deploy the gifts that he's put, in, put inside us. I mean, all of that stuff, he wants it to happen, but it's part of getting on hit the same game plan, being on, on God's game plan. Now, he has given us something uh, that helps us to succeed well, and that's his grace. Grace is not like a license to do whatever we want. Grace is, his sustaining grace is what helps us through life day to day, week in, week out, in order for us to, to live the, the life that God has given us to live. And, and help us to avoid pitfalls. You know, there's a lot of pitfalls. And just already now in the last two days, you've seen, if you've been watching the Olympics, pitfalls. Yesterday, there was the, uh, the road race. And you had the three lead guys that looked like they were going to win. All of a sudden, they wipe out. Two of the, the two leaders wipe out, end up in a ditch. Three other people end up winning. And so it's, it's, there's pitfalls along the race of life. God says, I want you to be careful of falling into pitfalls. And he gives us his grace, his sustaining grace to, to avoid that. I want to look at some of those. 1 Peter 5 says, My purpose in writing to you is encourage you and assure you that the grace of God is with you no matter what happens. <clears throat> so no matter what happens, no matter what pitfalls, no matter what, what uh, wipeouts that, we, that end up coming our way uh, that may cause us to stumble, God says, my grace will get you through that. I want to look at three of those. Number one is, is God's sustaining grace helps us when we're tempted. Temptation's a common thing, right? Temptation's uh, something that can cause us to stumble. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, watch out. For attacks from the devil, your great enemy, he prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for some victim to devour. In other words, Satan wants to eat your lunch. He wants to harass you. He doesn't want you to get away easy out of this deal. Take a firm stand against him and be strong in your faith. So he says, Satan's like a lion. So being aware that there's somebody prowling around trying to hurt you is, is important. I think if you think that the devil doesn't exist, that only hurts you. It doesn't change his status. He's still a lion. Just now you're just thinking, you're just whistling through the forest saying, there's no lion. There's no lion. Everything's okay. Well, that doesn't really help you. So being aware, hey, there, there is a lion. There's somebody who wants to harass me. Now, the good news is when you put your faith in Christ, you actually change ownership from the devil to God. You belong now to God. It doesn't mean that Satan's happy about it, though. He still wants to harass you. He doesn't like the fact that you're God's. He's going to put a target on your back and say, and that's, some, that's why if you've put your faith in Christ, sometimes it seems to get harder, right? It's, it's more difficult because all of a sudden now you're under more attack than you were before because Satan's not happy with you. He's harassing you. And 
What happens is when we become Christ followers, we are now faced with new moral choices. It does matter between good and right, whether we're going to serve ourselves and be selfish or we're going to serve others. All those things now play a, a, a vital role in a way that they didn't before. And those are moral choices. Those are temptations. Will I do right? Will I not do right? Will I, will I serve others? Will I just serve myself? And temptations happen to all of us. It's not something like that you grow out of. Like I've been a Christian now 10 years. I no longer have that problem. I'm, you know, you know maybe, maybe I can look and give advice to others. No, it doesn't work like that. And we all struggle with that. Even Jesus was tempted. The Bible says he was tempted. He never sinned. Of course, the good news with that means is that temptation in and of itself is not a sin, right? Jesus was sinless, but he, he was still tempted. Just because you're tempted doesn't mean that you sin. That can be confusing sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way, right? You're thinking of something. You think of a bad thought. You think of, you, you, you think of something you know is not really God glorifying. You think, oh man, I've sinned again. No, not necessarily. Just because just you think thoughts doesn't mean that you've sinned. It doesn't mean that you're a bad, wicked, nasty person. It means you're normal. Because we all have, we can't control the thoughts that come into our minds. We can control whether we dwell on them, whether we act on them, certainly. But just because you think them doesn't mean that that's a temptation, right? That's, sometimes people confuse, like, in the area of sexual temptation. They think lust is the same as attraction. No, they're, they're not the same thing. In sexual temptation, if you're a guy and you see a good-looking girl walk by, and you go, wow, that's a good-looking girl. You know, I'm, I'm attracted. There's even a little arousal. That doesn't mean that you've sinned. It just means you're normal, right? You should be thankful for those feelings. If a, if, when ladies, if you see a, an amazing hunk of a guy walk by, you go, that guy is, he, you know, I'm attracted to him. Maybe even arousal. I mean, women do that to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly that's not sin, right? <laughs> There's a difference between acting on something. You know, if you dwell on a thought, you start thinking, fantasizing, what would it like to be to, with that person? What would it like to have sex with that person? That's now, oh, that's, you've moved from temptation now to sin. That's a different level. That's something, that's something else going on. And so being aware of, you know, temptation is, is common. It's common. Doesn't mean that you have to fall into the sin of what that temptation is pointing towards. Billy Graham was once interviewed by Larry King, and he said, you know, you've had decades and decades of public ministry, and, and you've never had a scandal. You've been known for integrity. How have you been able to do that? He quoted, Billy Graham quoted this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Read it. Let's read it out loud together. The temptations that you have are the same ones that all people have, but you can trust God. He will not let you be tempted more than you can stand. When you are tempted, God will also give you a way to escape. Then you will be able to stand it. So this comes from God's grace. God's grace, his sustaining grace, when you're tempted, he's going to give you a way to escape. Because we all, everybody here has experiences the same temptations. Sometimes we think that ours are unique. You know, nobody's experienced the temptations I've experienced. I've talked to people that say, you know, Andy, the reason why I, I did what I did is because my situation's unique. You know, and, and, and that's kind of like an excuse or something. But the truth is we've all experienced the same temptations. That's what makes us human. It's part of being part of humanity. And so it doesn't give us a reason. You know, sometimes people think, well, I, I, can, I can do whatever I want because of that. And because all temptation, temptations are similar, the solutions are similar. They're similar common solutions, which means God will give you a way of escape. That might mean turning off the television. It might mean changing the channel. It might mean walking out of a movie theater. It might mean having to flee out of a doorway. It means you do what you need to do in order to avoid falling into what the temptation is leading towards. And God's sustaining grace will help you. Number two, God's sustaining grace helps me to stand when I'm tired. Sometimes it's not that I'm tempted, I'm just tired. I'm just exhausted. 
I don't have any more energy. And it can be tough. It, it just to, to live life alone costs, is, is a lot, it's costly. It's a, it takes a lot of energy. But to swim upstream, to walk the moral high ground, that's even harder. <clears throat> it's easy to just do whatever's easiest. There's a lot of people doing that. Just take the easy path. That's the easy path. But of course, whenever you're doing that, you're just coasting. And when you're coasting, it means you're going downhill. If you're going to go uphill, if you're going to, if you're going to go uh, against the culture, which the culture does, does one thing, but what Christ calls us to do is often counterculture. So it takes even more energy. It takes even more effort. And so God's sustaining grace will give you the energy to do that. Some of you, <clears throat> you're the only believer in your workplace. That's tiring. That's exhausting, right? You're always upholding the standard. You're living like in a glass house. People are holding you a higher level. <clears throat> They're looking for anything they can, you know, chip away at you. Hey, I see. And then they, 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 it's hard, right? That's difficult to be in that situation. God's sustaining grace will be there with you. You know, when everybody starts talking, you know, they start telling a dirty joke and you don't want to be part of that. And then they tease you, right? What's your problem, man? You think you're better than us? I play handball with the guys. None of them are believers. And, and, and uh, they all curse like most people do, right? I don't. And it kind of stands out, you know, and they look at me like, what's your problem? They go, we'll get you cursing after a while. Just give us a, <laughs> you know, and just last week I, I missed the shot I should have gotten. You know, I yell out, shoot. And they looked at me, shoot. What kind of word is shoot? Let me, there's a word very similar that you're supposed to be saying right now. <laughs> it's just this, you know, it's a stand I take because uh, the Bible says we're not supposed to curse. And so it's hard. Sometimes that's the easy stuff, what I just mentioned. Sometimes it's even harder, right? And you can get exhausted. You get tired. You want to give up. God's sustaining grace gets us through. God says, let us not grow weary in doing right, for we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. So there's something God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. There's, there's a blessing at the end of that, and my grace will get you there. It, but it's, there's sometimes we, when somebody's rude to us, we don't want to be nice back, right? We want to be rude back. We don't want to be kind back. You know, if you're in a relationship, sometimes you don't feel like being kind, right? Sometimes you just feel like, you know, it just doesn't, it's not coming naturally. This past week, I've experienced a fair amount of jet lag coming, you know, flying back a uh, six hour difference from where I was at. I didn't always feel like being nice to everybody in my home. So they figured that out, just gave me some room. <laughs> but it's hard sometimes, right? You just need God's grace to cover you. Second Corinthians 1 says, it is God who gives us the ability to stand firm for Christ. There's that word again, standing firm. He has commissioned us. And he has identified us to his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So it's God's Holy Spirit that, that gives us the ability to make it through. Now, some of you are thinking, you know, I just, yeah, it's real hard to live the Christian life. I try. I try to do what God wants me to do. I'm trying real hard to, to do that. Well, here's what you need to know. It's not hard to live the Christian life. It's impossible. It really is. Just trying to do the right thing, to please God, to get God's favor, to get Him to be happy with you, to just punch all the right things, it's, it's, that's an impossible task. And so you'll always be exhausted, you'll always be tired, and you'll always come up short. So what is the expectations for being a Christ follower? Well, the expectations are not trying real hard, it's trusting just, it's just kind of living in a place where we just trust and say, God, I'm going to let you live through me. I'm going to let Christ live through me. That's why these things that we recycle over and over, it's the same fundamentals. If you've been in church any length of time, you hear the same stuff over and over. Oh, it's prayer. He's talking about that again. Reading the Bible. Oh my goodness. Can't he be more imaginative? It's just the same thing. Joining a small group, <laughs> come on, doesn't he know I'm busy? See, we talk about the same things because these are the fundamentals that help us to learn to trust. It's, it's, it's the basic stuff. Prayer, it's, it's going to be the same thing 
in a century from now if Christ doesn't come back. It'll be the same, they'll be talking about the same things. Prayer, reading the Bible, being in a, in a small group where people can challenge us and encourage us. It's the same stuff. And it's God's grace, sustaining grace, works through those things so that we can learn to trust in God, let God work through us instead of us just trying real hard. Think of Noah. Noah, 120 years working on the ark. Think he got tired? You know, 120 years working on one project. You say, Andy, I was thinking of being dead about 20 years before that. <laughs> it's still tough. And it says that the, that the Bible says that the, the, the eyes of the Lord were upon Noah and giving him grace. It's God's grace got him through. And Moses, 40 years out in the wilderness, wandering around, 40 years before that, just waiting on the God for, on, to, to use him. 40 years of waiting in the wilderness, 40 years of watering in the wilderness, 40 of those years with people that were complaining all the time. They're whining. That probably wear, wear it on him a little bit. Just, just 40 years of whining. Think of that. And yet God gave him grace to get through that. So it's just trusting in the Lord. Just say, and, and you see that as you see Noah, as you see Moses, you see their life as a life of trusting in God's grace. And it got him through it. Number three, not just temptation or being tired, but sometimes just difficulties and troubles. God's sustaining grace helps me when I'm going through, when I'm, when I'm troubled, when I'm going through, through challenges, difficulties, problems. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so there's troubles that come in life. And so we're not, he says, Jesus says, you don't have to be surprised when it happens. It's going to happen. Well, there's different types of troubles, right? Some of them, they, they just try to blow us down like a strong wind. Some weigh us down like a sack of potatoes. But the worst, really, are those that come when they're undeserved. They're unrelenting, right? And they're, un, they're unexpected. They're, they come at us and, 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 and these kind of a, a cold cock us and surprise hit us. They're the worst. You know, if I bring troubles on myself, I don't like it. But I can deal with it a little better. Because I kind of think to myself, well, I, ca I caused this. You know, if I had done this, if I had done that, you know, I'm kind of in the situation I'm in because of myself. And so I better roll up my sleeves, do what I can to try to work through it in some way, clean it up. But the most difficult ones are the unfair ones, right? When you're the victim. You didn't have anything to do with it. It came out of nowhere. And then when it seems to go on and on, it's unrelenting. You know, if there's a... Uh, a conclusion to it? You look out? You go, well, you know, all I have to do is get through this time. There's a, you know, an opening at the end of this tunnel. But when the tunnel has no opening, it's just, you're just in it. And it's, uh, it just goes on and on. It's undeserved. It's unrelenting. It's, it's, those are the diff most difficult problems, right? And, and we need God's grace to get through that stuff. Because it's just, uh, it, can, it, can, it can wear us down. It, it just pulls us, and, and pulls us farther and farther down. We have all kinds of things. You know, there's disabilities, there's handicaps, there's, there's things, and there's a lot of things that we can't even control. You, we don't control where, you know, where we were born, who our parents were. We're not going to control where we, how we die. The, most of the major events between now and then we don't control. Our background, we don't control the things. We, I mean, those things are out of our control now. What's happened in our, in our past. And so all of that is, brings us to a place where we need God's grace to cover that. Where we learn to forgive. Where we learn to walk through those situations. And one of the things we, that is unhelpful is just playing the if-only game. You know, if only I'd done that. If only I'd married somebody else. If only my parents had been something else. But instead, learning to trust God and putting our focus on him. It says, don't worry because I am with you. Isaiah 41 says, don't be afraid because I am your God. I will make you strong. I will help you. I will support you with my right hand that saves you. And so he, notice all these promises there. He says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to make you strong. I'm going to help you. I'm going to support you. I'll save you. That covers everything. And then he says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. That's God's self 
that's his, his sustaining grace. Now, our tendency is to, especially in our culture, is to be self-reliant, right? About making myself, just doing it on my own. But when we're in problems that are above us, it's, that's when we need God the most. We, just, we really just say, God, I need your sustaining grace. I need your help to get through this. We're, how do we discover? How do we really get a hold of God's grace? Let me just go over a few things. Number one is, is calling out for God. That's, that's, that's the basic one. God, I need your help. Calling out to him. Not pretending that you're self-sufficient. Recognizing your limitations, but also recognizing God's power. Admitting your inadequacy. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble. That's what the humble, that's what humble, being humble is. Recognizing I can't do it on my own. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so give yourselves completely to God. Draw close to God, and God will draw close to you. And so we get grace when we recognize we need grace. When we go to God earnestly and uh, fervently and passionately. Jesus said at one point, those are the prayers that God answers. The ones he doesn't answer are the ones that we just, we don't have any passion in them. We just say them, we just, they're rote prayers. There's no heart in it. Did you know God listens to the intonation of your prayers? It matters to him. When my kids were small and I was asking them, you know, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for your birthday? They might rattle off a few things. Oh, I want that, I want that, I want that. But then they go, oh, but I really want that. Which one do you think I wrote down? Sure, the one that they were passionate about. The other ones, they just, well, whatever, you know. You're not really interested in that. God does something very similar. He's listening to, the, to how you pray. And so when you call out to God, when you pray passionately, he goes, oh, that really means something to him. That's part of the way we move God. It's part of the way we, we get God to, to kind of come, come into our lives in a greater way, which we all want. Well, we speak with passion, speak with heart. It's a big part of that. Go read the book of Psalms. You see, David did that. God called David a man after his own heart. You go, well, why is that? Well, read the book of Psalms. Ask that question. Why was God, why did he say that about David, that he was a man after his own heart? After his own heart? And then read the book of Psalms. And you'll see. You go, oh, well, that makes sense. Why? He was passionate. He prayed with passion. We don't even know his intonation, but you get it through his words. You figure it out real quick. Very impassioned. Number two, Fill your mind with God's word. God's word, God's promises, God's, the Holy Bible. When we read that and we memorize it, we think about it, we ponder it, we, we meditate on what God says. We start to align our thinking in, 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 in the way God wants us to, to align our thinking. And it starts to change the way we do, the way we view life. David says, I am completely discouraged. Revive me by watching more TV. <laughs> That's why some people would fill that out, right? You know, I'm just so tired. Guess I'll go watch TV. That's the answer. That's not the answer according to what God says. God says, revive me by your word. That's good advice. Re by listening to God's word. Letting God give us the answers to our life, biggest life problems. You know, there's a philosophy that's been around for a long time, but really got popularized about 40 years ago with the great theologian Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's talking to Luke Skywalker. He's going through a difficult time. And he goes, the answer, look within yourself, the answer you can find within you. Well, that's total garbage. When I look within me, I think that's the problem. That's not the answer. <laughs> I need to look to God for the answer. That's where we find the answers. God says he will give you the answers. And we find God's will in his word. When we go to his word, we say, okay, that's, that's what God's will is for me. That's the way I should be looking at the world. Number three is accept support from God's people. By helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law of God, the law of Christ. What's the, what's the law? It's, it's a love your neighbor as yourself. It's being kind, thinking about other people. The basis of much of Christianity is found in discovery with other people. 
And we talk about it, small groups, small groups, small groups. You heard about it last week, small groups. Not, we don't just say that because it's good for us. We say that because that is where we find our mental health, our emotional health, our physical health. That's how we grow spiritually is by having a, a group where we can belong, where we can support one another. It's part of the way the body of Christ is made up. Read 1 Corinthians 12. It says that's the body of Christ is made up of these of these networking of, of groups that come together that form the body of Christ. It's a very powerful thing. And then number four, hold on to the God's promises. Hold on to God's promises. There are many promises in God's word. Over 7,000 promises. God says, I want this for you. I want this gift for you. I want this for you. I want this. Here's one. It says he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired, but those who hope in the Lord, that's a key phrase, underline that, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So this is the sustaining power of God to give you power. He's got a lot of power. Do you know, God created the sun, and the sun in one second has has unleashed more power than we've used in all of human history. And the sun's going to burn for another 4 billion years. And he has the, the, God says, I have unlimited power, and, that's, and I want to give that to you. And he dispenses that through his sustaining grace. And so if you're in a place where you need God's power, you need his strength, you, maybe you're tempted or maybe you're tired or maybe you're, you've got troubles and you're looking at it and you, and you can just sink into a hole of worry and anxiety, God says, I have hope for you. I have, I have the strength to get you through that. That's the promise that we believe in. That's the, and, and God comes alongside us, changes our attitude, changes our circumstances often as we put our trust in him. Would you stand with me? I want to close in prayer. We're just going to commit this moment. Say, God, thank you. Because we did a Bible study about God's promises for us. This is his, his, what he offers you. He says, I want you to walk into this. If our prayer teams can come up, you can, I'm going to invite you just a moment to come and receive prayer. Let's pray. Father, come, Lord. Come into this place right now. Lord, I pray a special prayer for those who are discouraged today. You may be struggling with worry or you can't fix something and you look at it and you go, you just look and you see maybe devastation. Maybe you've got some guilt and shame associated with that because the part you played. God says, I can handle that if you give it to him. You may be dealing with depression or financial conflict or conflict in your home, unemployment, infertility, all kinds of things. God says, I can handle that. But it begins by you sharing and doing your part. You come to him. Call out to God. Be passionate about what you want before God. Say, God, I really want this. If you want a prayer to be answered, you have got to demonstrate you care. Oh, Heavenly Father, right now, Lord, we place Christ in the center. We lift up Jesus Christ. We thank you for the, the life that he's given us. Any of you who've never put ownership in to him. I, I Do that now. Say, God, right now, I want to transfer my ownership to Jesus Christ. And the life that he lived, the promise and the hope that he gives me, I want to live for Christ. And Lord, we just ask for your sustaining grace. Lord, I pray that you just wrap your arms of love and grace around each person here, particularly those who are struggling with temptation, with being tired, that Lord, just you infuse them with energy, with vision. 
those of you who are heavy loaded with trouble, Lord, may you come alongside them. Lift them out of that place of discouragement. Give them hope, Lord. That they wouldn't try to do it by themselves, that they would come alongside other people. And discover a new level of grace and strength. Lord, we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.